thank you so much everyone for joining us. Uh, we had about 100 people sign up for this thing, so we're thrilled at the turnout today. We're really excited to uh, just let you know some tips and tricks on how to maintain uh, this equipment that we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to go through a number of different pieces of equipment. Um, we could probably spend three or four days with you, but we're going to condense it down into one hour and give you just a lot of the high level um, pieces of information that we really think you're going to be able to take back to your shop and to your organization, hopefully increase efficiencies just a little bit and, and get a longer lifespan out of your equipment. And if you happen to have some of our equipment on rent, um, I guess help us keep it maintained as, as you have it out on your projects. So um, we're going to go through battery maintenance. We're going to talk about what your technicians should keep with them at all times when they're kind of out on the road and um, going to a trailer to do some troubleshooting. We'll talk about message boards. We'll talk about aero boards. We're going to talk about attenuators and walk you through some of those, including one right behind the camera right now that was uh, total. <laughs> um, and then um, portable traffic signals. So we'll go through some of that. Those are increasingly popular. Um, and then I encourage you to, to uh, submit your questions in, in the chat of this webinar. Uh, we have Tim who's going to be monitoring that and he'll bring any relevant questions. We'll address them real time. Um, this is probably unlike most webinars you've, you've been sitting through since uh, COVID started back in uh, February, March. Um, we're going to have some fun, uh, try and keep it entertaining. Um, a lot of you are going to relate to the things that we're talking about here today. Um, we live and breathe this stuff all day, every day. Um, if you don't know who Street Smart is, just a quick background. Uh, headquartered in Minnesota, that's where we are here today. It's actually pretty hot. So you're going to see us wiping sweat off our brows and stuff like that. Of course, yesterday was about 15 degrees uh, cooler, but hey, we'll take it. Um, we are the nation's largest provider of this rental equipment, um, specifically focused on traffic safety. So we don't rent skid loaders. We don't rent scissors lifts. We don't rent popcorn machines and tents. We only deal with traffic safety equipment. And, and again, we're excited to, to share with you the information we have queued up today. Um, just to give you an idea of how much equipment we have, I think we've, we've done rental in about 47 states already this year alone. So we have stuff scattered all over the United States and Canada. Guys, if you were to take our stuff and, and park it in a single file line, it would stretch about seven and a half miles. So uh, when we say we're the experts in the industry and in keeping this stuff maintained, that's why. Um, um, you know, we have this stuff in our yards, in our shops, keeping it in tip top shape all the time. Um, so that's why we're here today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Joe Balaban. Joe is our national operations uh, director. He kind of oversees all of our technicians across all of our shops. Um, Joe has been with us for about 12 and a half years. Hi, Joe. Ready? These things, uh, these things kosher here today. Um, so Joe, I've, you know, referred to you as Yoda. I've referred to you as MacGyver in some of the marketing for this webinar. So, you know, which one would you, I guess, most relate to? Is it Yoda or is it MacGyver? I'm going to say it's Yoda. <laughs> we have the same hairdo. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, so Joe, before we dive into, you know, lead acid batteries, which I'm sure everyone is dying to know more about. A um, couple quick questions. If I were to hand you a stack of a million dollars, what would you do with it? I'd say buy a lake home and a bunch of hunting land. Hunting land and a lake home. Nice. Very common answer for us Minnesotans. Absolutely. Um, now, what if you had the next four weeks off? What would you do? Where would you go? Camp and fish. Another Minnesota answer. Camp and fish. Okay. Put that hunting land to good use. That's right. right. <laughs> uh, what was your first car? 1975. Chevy Silverado pickup. Oh, nice. Still nice. love the square body style to this day. Yeah, probably be a little bit rusty now if you had it, right? Probably a touch. <laughs> I always get a kick out of seeing those old Chevys that don't have any rust on them. For those of you not in the northern states without road salt, um, you don't know what we're talking about. Uh, it's about five years before they start rusting out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last one. Favorite historical figure and why? You know, this was a tough one. I'm going to have to say John Rockefeller. Oh, he, wow. He was a problem solver. He created solutions with nothing. Uh, the guy was just an innovator. Right. Nice. Very good. All right. So now you know a little bit more about Joe. Uh, great guy. He's going to kind of be your, your main host today. 
uh, we're going to walk over to the lead acid battery section and we'll get started talking about batteries. All right. All right, guys. So first off, we're going to talk about lead acid batteries. Uh, the reason why we're going to start off with batteries is this is the engine that runs your message boards. These things is what makes it power up. Without batteries, without solar, none of our equipment would run. Almost every piece of equipment that we own today is ran off these types of batteries. Uh, these ones specifically, they're going to be six volt batteries. We use interstate GC2s, ECL, UTLs. So it's a 225 amp hour battery. Again, six volt. So you have to have at least two of them to run a 12 volt system. Uh, uh, in each one of these batteries is distilled water. Okay, you have to make sure that you're always filling up your batteries with distilled water and making sure that they're topped off. So as you can see kind of in here, I'm sure it's difficult to see with the camera, but when you wiggle it a little bit, you can see that the water is in there and it's all the way up to the top. You want to make sure that your plates are covered with the water at all times. Um, this is going to be very specific to the north, but anytime you add distilled water in the winter time, you have to make sure that you charge your batteries. If you don't charge your batteries, that water and that acid is going to separate and then you can have freezing. Okay, another big thing when it comes to the, to the batteries is going to be charging. Um, and to make sure you're going to get a good charge is you have to get a load tester, right? Oh, I'm sorry, this is a load tester here. So we have, we have our load tester. This is going to be the best way to test the battery. Uh, when it comes to the load tester, you do not need to separate the batteries. You just go ahead, put the negative on the negative, positive on the positive. These types of batteries you load test at 300 amps. You crank this bad boy up to 300 amps, wait 15 seconds and see where your voltage lies. Okay, your voltage should be plus five volts. It could be 5.2, 5.4, 5.6. Uh, that's going to determine how good your battery is. Another way to test your batteries if you don't have a load tester is going to be the specific gravity test. Um, you can buy the little plungers at, at any of your um, automotive hardware stores. Uh, but again, a load test is the best way to test your battery. Make sure that it's going to run, uh, run good for you for the whole season. Bill, can you just talk about what we're looking at here? Why do you have them all wired together like that? Yeah, absolutely. So we take our, our batteries and we lay them out on a pallet, as you see here. So every one of these, we have a positive link to a negative. That's called hooking the batteries up in series. When you hook the negative up to the positive, that makes one 12 volt battery versus two six volts. You know, think of it like a flashlight, right? You have a flashlight, you drop the one battery in, then the next one goes on top and on top of that, so you have a positive negative touching. Anytime you run a battery in series, it doubles the voltage, okay? Now we hook them up negative to negative, positive to positive, all the way around. What that does is that that's gonna double your amp hour, double your capacity. So instead of a 225 amp hour battery here, now we have a 450 amp hour battery system that's now 12 volts. Um, so when we're charging something like this, we want to make sure that you're spanning your system. Um, I'm sure many of you have talked to me on the phone and we've talked about taking loads off, stuff like that. We always span the system. What I mean by that is we have this group of batteries here is all linked, is all linked up. Okay. So we hook up the negative here, span the system. We go all the way over here to the positive. Now when I turn on the charger, it's gonna get every single one of these batteries in this line here. Um, if, if all we did was hook it up to the 12 volt like that, what's gonna happen there is it's gonna charge these two batteries, then it's gonna bleed onto the next, bleed onto the next, so on and so forth. So these will be fully charged where these haven't even been touched yet. Make sure that you're spanning your group of batteries to get a full charge. This goes for any pallet that you're doing, your message boards, arrow boards, always span the entire group of batteries. Okay, so now we're gonna go into changing the batteries in your message board. Okay, thank you, sir. So if we have 
if you have um, a dead battery, say you do a load test on your battery and you have one bad one, you want to replace all four batteries or all eight batteries that, that are in that system. What happens with one bad one is it takes from all the others to try to maintain its battery charge. Uh, when it does that, it puts a lot of stress on the other batteries. They're going to die prematurely. They're going to be worn prematurely. And that's just a lot of money. We all know that these batteries are very expensive. This is the lifeline of your boards, aero boards, anything. Make sure that you're maintaining and keeping these maintained the whole time. Okay. Um, so when you're charging them, either you replace the entire one or you need to find a like battery. That's going to be a like year and a like load test. Load test is the most important. You know, usually you're not going to find a 2017 battery and a 2019 battery that load test the same. That's why we say like year as well. Um, so where do we find, where do we, where could we buy a load tester? You can buy load testers online or at your battery supply store. Uh, we bought this one specifically from Interstate. Um, so when it comes to charging the batteries, again, you can use a car charger just like this. Now these are deep cycle batteries, so you have to think of it like a crock pot, right? Low and slow all the time, right? When you hook up your batteries, you want to have it on a five amp or less charge for a long period of time. If you're doing a full pallet like this, I suggest at least charging it for three days. Um, as you can see here, these look like new batteries and they are new batteries. We charge new batteries all the time. Doesn't matter who your vendor is, your batteries are only going to come in 80% charged. You must charge your batteries before putting them in, in any piece of equipment. Otherwise, you're already, you're already coming up short as soon as you deploy a brand new board. So with an external battery charger, um, you know, I'm going to call it a, a dumb charger. Right? You just put it on your, your lowest amperage, right? two to five amps for long periods of time, depending on your quantity of batteries. If you have an internal charger, right? a lot of the message boards come with chargers, stuff like that. Or if you're using a, a DSL IOTA 30 with the IQ4, uh, those are smart chargers. You can plug those in and leave them plugged in indefinitely and they're not going to harm your battery. Um, so. Uh, majority of manufacturers use the IOTAs or the, I think it's a, the Power, PowerWorks uh, charger. Uh, they all work the same. So just make sure that you just plug those in. Uh, always verify it when you plug it in, in case there's a blown fuse or a poor connection, right? You put your, your voltmeter on your batteries, check out the voltage, plug it into the charger and make sure that that voltage increases. The more batteries you have, the slower it's gonna increase. So um, now we have our, our battery storage, okay? So anytime you're storing batteries, right, you're probably gonna be carrying them. You can get these from your battery supplier. Uh, they just hook right onto them on these two little clips here. Right, very handy. And right, then it keeps your hands off of, off of the battery in case it's cracked or there's corrosion, you know, acid on there. It's gonna get into the cracks of your hands. It's gonna burn. Nobody wants that. Um, I always suggest carrying two at a time. Uh, the batteries are heavier, they're 55 pounds each. So when you carry them two at a time, then you're set carrying them. You're not leaning off the one side, which can cause back injuries. So now when it comes to storage, right, we have two different storing methods. Now we have the cold north, which we are in. So with the winter uh, fast upon us here, you're going to want to make sure that your batteries are charged if you're going to leave them inside your message boards, error boards, et cetera. Put them out in the yard, make sure your solar panels are clean, make sure they're tilted at an angle and facing the south. That's gonna help keep those as charged as possible. As long as they're charging, the batteries are always boiling, they're churning, you're not gonna get that separation between the acid and the water, and they're not gonna freeze and crack. Once they freeze, they expand, it breaks the plastic casing, it pops the tops, it messes with the plates. A frozen battery is just a bad day for a battery. It's gonna break it. It's not gonna work very well anymore. Uh, down south, you have just the opposite problem of freezing, right? This is gonna be more of your, your summer storage while the unit's out there. You have to make sure you're maintaining and adding water. 
all that heat is going to create more boil off than it would in a, a you know 70 degree day so down south you're going to want you're going to want to make sure you check your water i would say bi-monthly at the latest make sure you're topping that off for peak battery performance Right. Another thing that's really going to mess with your batteries is corrosion. Corrosion is very common. As you can see right down here, this one terminal has been eaten away. And the nut is completely deteriorated. The spindles uh, deteriorated as well. This thing is stuck on there. At this point, you have a bad battery. There's nothing that, that we can do about that. As you can see here, these are the first stages before it gets to that point. When you see something like this, you can't just clean it off. You have to cut it back here, put a new end on there, and that's what's gonna save your cable, it's gonna save your batteries, and your batteries are gonna last longer and run better for you. Um, the reason you have to cut it back is that as you can see, the corrosion has already gotten inside the wire, and it's gonna keep traveling up this wire. Cut it back, make sure everything looks good, or just create new cables. You can buy uh, mass quantities of cable and ends for fairly cheap. And you're talking, you know, a total setup with cables. You can get, you know, 100 foot rolls of cable for cheap. You can get the ends for, for cheap. I mean, you're talking, you know, what, eight bucks to do an entire unit. So just make sure you're keeping all your cables clean and everything else. Another good way to prevent that is with battery terminal spray. Uh, we use very specific terminal spray. It's, um, um, it's called Purple Guard and it's made by Windsor. So that stuff is, we found to be the best. It's the thickest, it holds on to the terminals the best, uh, and it really prevents any of that corrosion. So when you're using it, make sure that you cover the entire, uh, the entire battery cable. I'm sorry, the, the copper on the cable and this whole, uh, connection point here. Just spray it all over. I understand it sucks to get the stuff all over your hands when you're changing batteries, but that's the best way to prevent any kind of corrosion and then depletion of your batteries prematurely. Okay, Joe, I'll give you a quick drink of water here and we'll finish Joe, up with batteries here in just a second. One question on topic two, should you use dielectric grease? Um, yeah, you can. So you, repeat the question, please. Yeah, uh, you could definitely use dielectric grease on your battery terminals, that's not gonna hurt anything. Really what that does, I mean, dielectric grease is really good. It's super thick. So what it does, what creates that corrosion is gonna be your burn off. Um, uh, it, every one of these has little holes in it, which is gonna, those little holes, that's what creates your, um, your air and your, your burn off. It's gonna let out vapor. And that vapor is very close to these terminals so, you know, having any, any kind of, you know, dialectic grease, stuff like that is going to help prevent any type of corrosion. Um, so with that, you also want to keep your, your batteries clean. Thank you. So this is the exact stuff that we use. Okay. It's, it's super thick. Like I said, like a dialectic grease. Dave, you want to mm -hmm. bring it over right over here. All right. So just make sure that you saturate the area, hit all the metal just like that. And I would do that, you know, once every other year as needed. Okay. So You'll notice to, right away. Something to for sure keep in your truck, it sounds like. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's that's going to be almost before you even get the board out. If you change the battery, make sure you're putting something on it like that. Okay. So let's wrap up here with batteries. About one more minute on batteries, and then we're going to head over to the message board. Perfect. Uh, so or, I'm sorry, to the tech truck. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, uh, just, just a couple things to, to hit real quick on these. Big not to do's for battery life and longevity. A battery has a five year life expectancy. You will shorten that life expectancy if you drain a battery all the way. There is no memory in batteries like this or at all. So uh, if you kill a battery and by killing it, right, if you drop that battery to one or two volts, you half life the battery. Now it's life expectancy is two and a half years. So the same thing goes with an overcharge. Okay, overcharges can happen by adding battery acid, right? Say a battery tips over, the water spills out, right? Uh, your local battery guy wants you to add battery acid. You don't ever add battery acid. All you do is add water. 
the acid gets absorbed into the plates. So you always just want to add water. So, All right, lightning round, ready? I'm ready. Uh, common myths, I want to state a myth and you say yes or no. All right, let's go. <laughs> Um, I should not store batteries directly on concrete. It, it drains them. It's not good for them. That is a myth. You can store a battery on concrete just fine. None of that is going to harm charging or holding a charge for a battery. Okay. Um, you kind of hit on it already. You stole my thunder. Only cold, freezing weather affects batteries. Down in Arizona, Texas, you're fine. Nope, that is also a myth. Um, when you get the, the hot weather, it's also going to put a huge toll on your battery. As I'm sure many of you Southerners have found out, you know, on those super hot days, you get out to your vehicle and your batteries just won't start. So the cold weather and the hot weather, extremes in both, have a major effect on batteries. Okay. Um, and then I guess the last thing, and maybe you'll hit on it when we talk about message boards, but, um, you know, mice. Mice love batteries. What's the first thing you should do if you come to a uh, a situation where you got a big mouse nest on top of your batteries. Yeah, you just want to you want to clean it out properly. You know, get all the stuff out of there, and then um, you know, I've heard dryer sheets, mothballs, and then even some daikon. You know, anything that's gonna you know really kill them or keep them away. Um, you know, a, a good a good mouse repellent or killer is gonna be great for your battery boxes, even inside the control boxes stuff like that. I've even heard horror stories of them getting inside the sign case and making a nest in there, which blew my mind. I have no idea how they got in there, but um, yeah, I, I spoke with a customer last week that that actually happened to. So, Okay, cool. J Joel, thanks for telling us all about batteries. Obviously, uh, if you have questions about batteries, if you have questions about anything we talk about today, you know how to get a hold of us. Uh, shoot us an email, give us a call. Um, we'll take care of you, even if you're not currently doing business with us. We don't care. We'll, we'll help you out and uh, make sure you're up and running. Let's head over to the technician's truck and we're going to talk about um, some of the must haves when you are going to go out, maybe diagnose uh, a, a troublesome message board or an arrow board. Um, what are some of the, the things, Joe, that your technician should absolutely have in their truck at all times? Okay, guys. So these are going to be your most commonly used pieces um, of tools, ends, uh, just all sorts of different stuff to make sure that your tech can get off the road quickly and safely. If all this stuff is going to help, help them just get off the road right away. So as you can see here, we have batteries, right? We can just put a strap in on the back, close up the tailgate. You know, I say bring one if not two message boards worth of batteries with you at all times there's never a reason not to bring batteries as we all know people steal them they go bad this is the lifeline always bring batteries with you another thing is going to be your electrical supplies we have you have butt splices terminal ends all sorts of different sizes you know this isn't just for batteries right? always have some battery lugs Always have some extra battery cables uh, from going from battery, battery to battery. Um, but it's not just for batteries. If there's a, a communication wire is broken, we can always fix it with butt splices, right? Temporary fix to make, make sure you can be at, back out on the road quickly. Um, with that, you're going to need a little bit of electrical tools, you know, a good stripper and a good crimper um, are definitely a must. Now, one key point. Joe's favorite thing? Is gonna be your best friend. <laughs> this is your best friend. When you go out on the road, you never leave without your best friend. We use the Sperry DM6400, which is now discontinued. They have the DM6410. Uh, they run about 45 to $50. You can buy them at Home Depot, Amazon, whatever it is. Uh, there's no specific reason why we got this one in particular. We just bought one, it worked well, they're fairly cheap. So we buy all of our techs, the same one. Now we're all on the same page. We know exactly what the dials do. Um, so with this, you got your power button here, right? So you got the V with the dots and the line, that's gonna be for your DC power, okay? The squiggly line, that's gonna be for your AC because it's alternating current. Uh, so for us, the main points that we're going to use 
is going to be your 20 volts DC. Or that one that looks like a little speaker and a diode. And that's going to be your continuity test. As you can see right now, it's at a one. When you touch these together, it beeps and it's going to drop down to a zero. This continuity test is very important to test wires. If you aren't sure if you have a break in a wire, you can run a continuity test on that wire and figure that out very quickly. Uh, the main one that we use obviously is gonna be your DC. It's set for 20, but it's a 12 volt, um, 12 volt tester. So as you can see here, if I just touch it to the batteries, all right, this battery is at, 6.3839. So that's going to be a fully charged battery. So this, again, is your best friend. Don't leave home without it. If you want to play a prank on Joe, hide his voltmeter. <laughs> All right. What else about the tech truck? Okay. So, guys, just uh, simple stuff that, that you should have, right? This is a snap ring pliers. It's for all the jacks on any type of message board, arrow board. This is always an awesome tool to have with you. Very easy to use. You know, typical drills, stuff like that. You know, make sure you have your safety vest, your bug sprays, your sunscreen, flashlights. Always be prepared to get your guys off the road right away. Okay, all this stuff is to help them get off the road immediately. So. If you have any questions, you can always call us. We can help diagnose problems. Again, bring your best friend. We can help you very quickly and get your guy off the road safely and quickly. Uh, as you can see here, we do have a couple other items in our trucks always. Spare tire, jacks in case, uh, you know, we have a farmer jack in case something happens. Um, a shovel to level it off if you're not on a level surface, which we all know when we've deployed, you're never on a level surface. Um, also a good one to have would be like some good wood blocks, you know, some uh, two by eight, something wider to uh, lay down on your, on the ground to have a nice steady uh, platform for your message board. Okay. So Joe, the drills are a couple hundred bucks maybe, but you know, if you were to guess these tools, how much, how much of an investment is it to, to make sure your team is prepared? It, this is not a high investment at all. I mean, these are, you know, the, the drills and stuff is going to be your, your biggest investment. And they're not even necessary. Hand tools, you know, a, a good um, uh, socket set. So, I mean, we'll call it $300 and your guy's going to be fully prepared, you know, minus this stuff. But $300 bucks for, for a good ratchet set. All this stuff. You know, your voltmeter, all your ends, clips, tools, and your guy will be super prepared and get off that road quickly as possible. Be awesome. safe. Awesome. Um, people on the webinar, if you want a picture of what's in that um, kind of kit over there that Joe talked about first, we'd be happy to send that if you want to request that. Uh, Tim, any questions that have come in about the different uh, tools uh, that the technician should have on them at all times? Uh, no question okay. there. One question though on the batteries, what would you recommend for wires to connect the batteries? And then what would be kind of the next step of wire that's most commonly used? Okay, that, that's a very good, very good question. Uh, we use uh, six gauge wire. So it's a six gauge wire, um, copper stranded for all of our battery connections. Anything that's going to be connecting to a battery to, uh, you know, to run the load, uh, your pump, stuff like that. Um, everything else we use, uh, you know, we'll use a 14 gauge or a 16 gauge wire, even to run solar, something like that. Um, uh, even a underground irrigation wire is heavily insulated and it actually is a very good wire to use for solar and any other uh, miscellaneous wiring jobs that you have. Okay. So with that said, I think we can start moving right over to the, to the message board here. Okay, so let me just start off by saying right away that we use a checklist here at, at Street Smart anytime we're going over one of the message boards. It's a very detailed, it's a very, uh, very detailed checklist. So it breaks it down to testing jacks, 
uh, character cards, lights, you know, it's, it covers everything. If you're interested in getting a copy of the checklist, just let us know and we'll send you over a copy of that. Now, the second lifeline to any piece of equipment is gonna be your solar panels. Solar panels are huge and they make a very big difference on, on your application and how you set it up. So right away, when you're testing a solar panel, your solar panel is gonna run at 21 volts. I know that doesn't sound right, but that's what they run at and that's what gets you your, your 12 volt charge. So if you have a solar panel that's not connected to anything, you put a voltmeter to it, you're gonna run at 21 volts. That's exactly what you want. If there's any kind of a load on there, then that's gonna change, okay? Dave, why don't you come over here? Joe, you wanna tell the group um, maybe the brand of message board we're looking at here and the different brands that you know how to fix. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so what we're looking at here right now is a touchscreen Vermac PCMS 1210. This is your standard message board. Street Smart carries hundreds of these. It's kind of our, our main board is gonna be the 1210. Um, all manufacturers have a, a, a three line message board. This is Vermax version of that. So, um, and to answer your question, what we repair is everything. We can always repair it. If we can't repair it, we'll find somebody for you that can. <laughs> okay, um, so now when it, when it comes to the solar panels, Okay, number one thing for solar panels is keep them clean. You got to make sure that you're wiping them off free of debris, free of any kind of obstructions, free of shadowing. If there's a tree hanging over it, that's really going to uh, mess up your charging ability. Um, as you can see right now, our solar is 15.69 volts running at 4.76 amps. Guys. This is just a standard cell phone. Nothing fancy, nothing big. If I put this cell phone on that message board, we're gonna lose a lot of charging ability, okay? My cell phone covers that panel only 1.6%. We're gonna lose 20% of its charging ability with that cell phone on there. Dave, you wanna come back in here? That was well over the four, the four amp range now we're at 3.15. So wait a second. You put your cell phone on the solar panels and you lost that much amperage. That yes, right? yep, absolutely. And amperage is, is what charges your batteries, okay? Your amperage and your voltage are, is always gonna fluctuate. It's gonna fluctuate due to your solar panels being at watts, right? So you have an 85 watt solar panel Okay, you have amps times volts equals watts. The higher the voltage, the lower the amperage and vice versa. Okay, the optimum charging on most of these panels is gonna be right around that 17 volts. All panels are labeled with their optimum voltage. Um, but to answer Brady's question, yes, a very small amount of coverage on your solar panel will significantly impact your charging ability. You have to make sure that you're not under anything. You don't have any trees, anything else. Again, we're at a 20% loss from a cell phone. That was 18 square inches on a solar panel that is 1,113 square inches. Not much. So if I have a few message boards, I want to keep them protected, put them under a bridge or something for a week until we're going to use them again. That's probably not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. Nope. Storing. If you're storing outdoors, you want to make sure that, that it's in the sun. If you're storing indoors or protecting them somehow in a shed, something, you're going to want to put them on a battery charger. Okay, now brings me to another point, and that's going to be pointing your solar panels to the south. Okay, we live in the northern hemisphere. Make sure that you point your solar panels to the south. That's going to make a huge difference. Okay, on any long term setup you're going you're going to want to change the angle okay most message boards are going to have some type of a tilt and rotate this is vermax version you crank it up and your solar panels are going to tilt why you ask you have to think of light reflection if your solar panels are flat right a 90 degree your sun's coming in it's going to hit 
and reflect off instead of absorbing into that solar panel. If you put that solar panel at an angle, when that sun hits it, it absorbs it and that's gonna create a better charge for you. Uh, as an example, here in Minnesota, in the winter time, we want our solar panels at 22 degrees, okay? 90 degrees is flat, zero degrees is vertical, 22 degrees, okay? In the summertime and in the fall, you want your panels at a 45 degree angle. In the winter time, or uh, sorry, in the summertime, you want them at a 68 degree angle, again, because the sun's gonna be a lot higher. Um, if you're just gonna go, if it's gonna sit out for a long period of time, make sure that you set your angle correctly. Uh, for any regional information on how you should set them up, contact me, I'll send you over that, that info. Uh, but uh, a good rule of thumb, 45 degrees in the north, 50 degrees in the south is gonna be your average uh, solar panel angle for optimum charging. Okay, so now this brings me to troubleshooting. Because solar panels is very, is a huge part of troubleshooting. Okay, so we have with the troubleshooting, again, I, I mentioned the, the volts versus the amps. So we're always looking at, at that data for troubleshooting. One of the first things I'm going to ask you is what your voltages are, what your solar is, stuff like that. If you don't have that type of information, that gets pointed to another section. Okay. I would say your most common issues, doesn't matter the brand, is gonna be your character cards and your solar regulators. Your character cards and solar regulators is also what runs it, right? I mean, if you have a, a character card malfunctioning, the board is not gonna read correctly. If your solar regulator is not working properly, it's not gonna charge correctly. Dead batteries is very rarely the reason, it's the result, okay? It's the cause of something else that actually malfunction. So you mean batteries don't die on their own, Joe? Usually not. Um, <laughs> so sometimes they do, but we can tell very quickly by looking at graphs and historical data if it's a battery or if it's something else. Most of the time, your battery issue is caused by something else. So uh, here at Street Smart, we can repair out pixels on pretty much any character card that you guys have give us a call, send it to us. We can repair it and send it back to you very quickly. Um, when it comes to the, the solar regulators, um, you know, every manufacturer has a different type of solar regulator. I'm gonna open this one up. This is Vermex solar regulator. As you can see, there are fuses, there's little connection pieces. So we just have to make sure that we're checking all those over. Um, and then you know what your components are. So solar regulators do go bad sometimes, you know, just like any kind of computerized piece of equipment. So again, bring your best friend, your voltmeter, and we'll be able to diagnose anything that's happening with a solar regulator, touchscreen, battery issues, stuff like that. I got, All right. I got you good? Right. Thank you. Just some water. Okay, we got to keep rolling here. We got about maybe 15 minutes left till we are at the top of the hour. We got a lot to cover. Um, let's keep cruising through some of the common issues here real quickly with the message board, Joe. Okay, I'm just going to go real quick overview on uh, normal trailer maintenance. Grease your hubs, okay? Grease your hubs, make sure everything looks good. Safety chains is, is another big one, okay? If you uh, find that your, your chain is ground down from dragging, replace it. That's a weak point. It can snap very easily. Uh, trailer lights is another big one. This can get ground down quickly, so you're gonna to wanna to replace your ends. Make sure all your trailer lights work before you start traveling. Uh, one thing that does happen is sometimes a board will get stuck up in the air, okay? When it's, when it's fully stuck up in the air, um, you, can always, you can always get it down. Give us a call, we'll be able to help you. Um, you know, sometimes it happens to, I mean, it happens to all, all sorts of different models and makes, so. Um, just give us a call. We've seen it. Okay. A another big one is going to be your hydraulic pump. Okay. Your hydraulic pump is what runs your mass up and down. Um, <clears throat> sorry. It runs your mass up and down and it keeps your, uh, uh, keeps your board up in the air. There's no, there's no clips or pins or anything else to keep it up in the air. Um, one major thing here 
that we like to do at Street Smart is we disconnect the pump from the battery before travel. Um, it's just a safety precaution. Um, you know, again, very, very few and far between, but we have seen something where the battery, the pump gets arced out, message board goes up in the air during travel. That's just no good all the way around the board. Um, one major thing that everybody's seen that's on here is stolen batteries. What do you mean by stolen batteries, Joe? Well, all your batteries run a $25 to $30 core. The thieves know that. This is a $100 bill for them. You buy a lot of beer with a hundred bucks. So stolen batteries is definitely a, a huge issue for us, for everybody. So we understand that. Now, if, you're, if your batteries are stolen, that means your cables are cut, okay? Your message board's up in the air, your cables are cut, you can't get the unit down. Every message board has a release valve, okay? Almost, most message boards use this exact same pump doesn't matter the brand. It's a very, very common pump. It's also a plow pump for those of us in the north. Okay, so what this does, you just grab a pliers and you break it free. And then very, very, very slowly as you twist it, you can see the message board goes down very slowly. Once you're all the way down, make sure to tighten the screw. I don't know how many times I've heard that the message board won't stay up and it's because they had their battery stolen. Never retighten that bell. Okay, that's just one way to get your to get your message board down. Now, again, with stolen stuff, that's why we have battery cables in your tech truck. That's why we have terminal ends in your tech truck. That's why we have um, uh, all your strippers and crimpers in your tech truck, so your guy can throw batteries back in and be out of there and safe very quickly. Now, one thing that all, um, all street smart message boards are going to have is a modem. So they all have modems in there um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have remote access to it. We can troubleshoot via modem. We can change messages via modem. And we can also track the unit via modem. Okay. Inside those modem has GPSs. We can look on there and find where your board is at. All of our modems run 100% of the time. We have them direct connected so they don't lose power when they turn off the board. If someone steals the batteries, they steal the batteries, and that's going to be a little tougher to do. Okay. Just checking, Tim, any questions on the message boards? Okay, if you do, please type them in the chat. Well, last thing, Joe, on the, on the message boards, talk about the break. All right, case breaks. You've all seen it. You get out there, your message board is turned. Okay, it's not facing the same direction that it should be. Again, this goes for every message board. Everybody has a break, okay? For the Vermac board specifically, there's the case break. As you can see, it tightens in here like so. Now, right, all the stuff sits out in the weather all the time. These are threaded rods and they become rusty and you know, it makes it impossible to turn. So if you're locking this down and your board still turns, there's a solution for that. You're in the ditch. There's always garbage in the ditch, usually beer cans. Find a beer can, smash it flat with your boot, pop it up, stick it in there, latch it down. It's never going to move again, promise you. If you can't find a beer can, uh, you can always try a chunk of rubber. There's always rubber from tires in there as well. That gets a little harder because it's a big, a big solid chunk, but a can works great. Okay. We gotta keep rolling. Uh, Dave, if you wanna follow me, I'm gonna to touch on the attenuators real quick. We'll talk about aero boards after that. Then we have Matt who's gonna talk about signals. We'll go in and check out our repair bench real quickly. So we got a lot to cover here in the next 10 minutes. So at Street Smart, we have an entire uh, rental fleet of uh, Scorpion uh, attenuators. So both the uh, towable attenuator as well as the truck mount attenuators. We rent and sell these devices. Okay, let's take a look at one that's been hit. Many of you have seen these things, obviously, maybe never gotten a, a close up look about what it looks like after it's been hit. So this was, was a trailer attenuator. Um, you can see it got hit from the rear on the left side, the driver's side, and it was hit by a box truck. Um, and it, it sheared this arrow board off 
as you can see, at a 90 degrees. This happened in Minnesota a couple of years ago, probably about 15 miles from our office. Um, luckily, like, like most of these stories end, nobody was hurt. Everybody got to walk away. Um, just within the last six weeks, we've probably had uh, six of these total. And when I say total, I mean SUVs hitting these things at 80 miles an hour. And again, fortunately, most of the time, the story ends that nobody got hurt, including the distracted driver. So um, we've been a, a partner of Traffics for many years. Uh, we're one of their distributors. We're a certified repair facility. So yes, you can repair uh, attenuators. You can't repair this one, but if you have minor nicks and dings in the you know, back fenders, obviously that's easy, but even these cushions, they're modular. So those can be replaced, um, unlike some of their competitive products. So here's a total unit. I love to bring that to trade shows because most people can relate to things like that. Um, here's a new uh, um, towable attenuator. And the, the defining characteristic of the Scorpion brand is what they call the TARS arms. And um, Dave, if you can follow me for just a second. Um, we have this hooked up to some power so the aero board is functioning. But this is really one of the defining characteristics of this product. So upon impact, there's a shear pin right in this uh, tongue that will obviously shear off the, the pintle hitch and tongue um, recesses back. And then these uh, telescoping um, arms, the anti-rotational arms, excuse me, um, then go into the back of the host vehicle. And that eliminates the vehicle from kicking off from one side to the other upon impact. Let's go back over to this um, total trailer because we can see here uh, what it looks like after it's been hit. So you can see um, upon impact, the shear bolt did its job and then those car's arms went into the back of that host vehicle, protecting the driver and, and all of the employees and equipment in front of it. Um, also, uh, in this case, the distracted driver uh, was able to walk away as well. So there's one of our um, rental trucks that's that's back. Actually, just yesterday, we replaced that unit because it uh, was total. A distracted driver hit that. So if you have any questions on uh, traffic's attenuators, please give us a call. We can uh, tell you exactly which parts need to be replaced if it is repairable. Um, you know, if you have an insurance claim or things like that and you need information, we're happy to be a resource. Uh, Wait, I, Joe, what did I miss? And then he's going to talk about airboards. I'd just like to add one thing. When he's talking about repairability. This sheet right here is something that, that I can send you, okay? So this is a post-impact sheet and it's gonna go off all these measurements. These things, because they are for running into um, and keeping people safe, they have a very tight tolerance. They have a one inch tolerance. So measurements that I'm gonna mainly be asking for is gonna be your A, B, E, and F. So what we're looking for there is to make sure that it's square. Um, as long as it's square, then it means None of the, the arms are bent and we can uh, just repay, repair, replace the parts that are damaged. Once the arm starts bending, um, again, we can replace just those as long as just the back half is damaged and not the front half. So they're very modular. We can repair these and this sheet being filled out is gonna tell us what parts need to be repaired. So now we'll go on to the aero boards here. So first and foremost, we're just gonna identify the parts of the aero board, okay? We have our lamps, our hoods, our screen, which is right here. Usually that's gonna be mounted inside the vehicle for an application like this. And Dave, you wanna come over here to the back right here. This bad boy right here is the power box. The power box is the brains of the operation and that's what holds all your different configurations, uh, makes the airboard run. The touch screen is just, uh, is just the interface between those. Uh, when it comes to the Vermac brand, you can take any touch screen and link it up to any airboard. There is a very specific process to that so you don't mess things up on the road. So give us a call, we can walk through that very easily. Um, when we're, if you're looking at, at, a, at an airboard, and you have a couple lamps that are out, a couple things we're gonna ask you to do is test those lamps, okay? You don't need an extra power supply for that. Remove two of the lamps and just switch them. Switch the lamps. If it now works, now we know it's controller or a wire issue, not necessarily a lamp. So it's a very easy, quick thing that we can do to try to, try to diagnose 
um, either a wire problem, controller problem, or a lamp problem. Two minutes, and you, we can figure out, determine really what we're looking at here. Um, so that's our quick overview on airboards. Again, any questions, contact us. Awesome. Let's go over to Matt, please, Dave. Uh, Matt is our expert on all things portable traffic signals. Um, so he'll provide kind of an overview of, of what he's standing in front of um, and some of the applications where people are starting to spec in and use portable traffic signals. Yep, thank you. Just uh, a couple quick minutes. Um, obviously, portable traffic signals are, are not a new technology. Uh, most of the industry is very familiar with portable traffic signals, but where the specifications have gone from even 10 years ago, um, they're really covering a lot of ground and there's a lot of new applications out there. Um, you know, specifically, we all know the traffic signal, their bread and butter is lane closure scenarios. Um, again, in, in these 10 years, um, the reliability, the quality, and uh, engineers have really caught on to the fact that these things can not just alternate traffic, they can control complete intersections um, and, and control a variety of situations that, that are thrown at us. Um, you know, an example of that is, um, some of the component options that we use and, and again are starting to see more and more of um, you know pedestrian crossings typically you see this stuff on on permanent scenarios um, video detection um, dedicated left turns um, emergency vehicle preemption these are all things that we're starting to see more and more of um, from a specification standard again um, another thing that's kind of taken the industry by storm, if you will, in the last few years is called a, a DAD device. Uh, DAD is an acronym for Driveway Assistance Device, and, and it does just that. It, instead of wasting, in a lane closure scenarios, um, you know, what do you do if there's side roads? What do you do if there's a driveway? Um, it was always tough wasting an entire phase on one vehicle coming in and out of a, a driveway um, so we said, instead of wasting that phase, we want to keep traffic moving and let's get a DAD device. So essentially what the DAD does um, is it lets the, the driver coming out of that driveway know which way traffic is moving via uh, a blinking left or a blinking right arrow, and they can safely merge into that direction of traffic. Again, it saves a phase. Uh, it's, it's one more situ situational um, issue that was overcome. Um, just by, you know, someone thinking outside the box. And, and again, I'm starting to see these spec in all over the country now, not just in one or two states. But um, again, it's something that the progressiveness of, of the PTS in the industry uh, is, is really taking off. Um, something we're seeing a lot, uh, a lot now, there's, there's different types. There's, there's AFADs, there's portable traffic signals. Um, each has its own unique scenario. Um, just really quick, the differences between the two. Uh, a portable traffic signal is great for long-term um, usage where multi-month usage where you want to set them up and walk away. Uh, you want to, you don't want to think about them until the job's over in two months. Whereas daily applications, you look at something like a cart style traffic signal or a, an AFAD device, again, for short-term or mobile operations where you don't need the big robust system uh, you want something more compact, more mobile, uh, and something that can be easily set up and taken down in a day or an hour for that matter. Uh, so there's a lot of options. Um, you know, I won't get too deep into the battery perspective of things. Um, just like anything on the side of the road now, uh, these things are, they all run off a of battery. They're all replenished via solar. Um, portable traffic signals typically have a much, much larger battery bank. Uh, anywhere from 12 to 16 batteries, whereas a message board these days might be two to four batteries. So obviously, uh, runtime and longevity is a, is a big concern for traffic signals because, again, you, you set them up and you need them to work for two, four, six, eight, ten 10 months at a time. So um, they, they really have to have their larger battery banks. So, um, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, maintenance and, and keeping an eye on those batteries is as important as ever when compared to a message board. Um, when a message board goes down, a message board goes down. Typically, um, nobody wants to see a message board go down, but it's usually not stopping or delaying traffic, whereas a portable traffic signal goes down, we have issues and we have issues right now and it needs to get rectified. 
Um, anything else you guys think that we can get covered? Or you that's want to pretty on? good. Okay. Tim mentioned Thank there you. weren't any questions, but guys, if you have questions about the portable traffic signals, uh, Matt is truly the expert. Again, somebody that our manufacturers lean on for recommendations and advice when they're enhancing their product. Uh, so please give us a call and, and we'll let you um, let you know what portable traffic signals and all the different configurations are all about. Real quickly, I know we're running out of time. I want to show you uh, how to load a message board onto a semi-trailer. We don't have a semi-trailer here, but uh, a real sim simple and easy solution are these forklift extensions. So we have Tim, who's our forklift model, very niche modeling business. Uh, what, Joe, four, four or five hundred dollars maybe? Yep, four to five hundred dollars, depending on, on where you buy them. But these things are going to save you a whole lot of hassle and a whole lot of time. As you can see, all you got to do is drive right up to it, lift it up, and you're good to go. There's no messing around with two forklifts. There's no messing around with floating docks. There's no messing around with, with anything. Drive underneath it. Four or five hundred bucks is going to save you so much time energy and this is a much safer way than using shorter forks and strapping to the top of the message board to get them loaded onto any truck all right so we load up to what we can get sometimes five message boards on a semi-trailer yeah. four to five message boards um, on, on any semi-trailer uh, if you have any questions on how to load uh, contact us we'll get you with uh, Ryan Kilpatrick our logistics manager and he'll send you pictures photos, videos of uh, loading, unloading, and how to stack them on there to make sure you're optimizing the most space on that truck. Okay, we got two to three more minutes. So let's take a look at our chest bench inside. Come on in, Dave. All right, so Joe, take us through real quickly now. I know you're long-winded. What, we, what do we got going on back here? What happens in this part of your shop? All right, guys, so th this is where we test character cards, repair character cards, test controllers, solar, solar regulators, everything. Uh, over here, we have, have our expansive bench of all of our cameras and sensor repairs um, that we can do as well. As you can see, we have a full message board up here, which is also used for testing all the stuff. Um, uh, just make note, we can, we can fix a lot of things. Uh, we can help you repair them. Next day shipping on parts if you need them uh, on our equipment, we'll get you that out right away. Obviously we hold you know, great warranties on, on everything and so do our manufacturers. Uh, so just know that we are, we are set up, we are ready for, for any challenge that, that you give us. Awesome. So let's get this thing wrapped up. Um, you know, we've reviewed a lot of information today, Joe, and thanks for, for helping out. Um, batteries, message boards, attenuators, aero boards, portable traffic signals, even, you know, how long your forks should be on your forklift. Um, keep in mind, a recording of this um, will be sent out to everybody that attended. If you had people in your office that you want to see it, please share it with them. Um, if you have people that signed up and weren't able to attend, we will email them a copy as well. Um, Joe, you know, do we charge people if they call us for technical questions? Absolutely not. Okay. You, you don't have to rent from us. You don't have to buy from us. You don't have to be our customer. You call me with any issue that you have. I'm going to help you step by step. If I can't help you, I'll get you in touch with somebody that can. Most every issue can be solved on the phone in 15 to 20 minutes. And we can get parts out to you next day, just like that. Right. Um, FaceTime is coming pretty handy, right? Let's see what you're looking at out there. Absolutely, so. you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you use a Droid or an iPhone, we have both of them here. We can do video calls, video calls and pictures, you know, along with your best friend, is gonna be key to getting anything repaired quickly and get your guy off the road. Right, nice. So just in summary, everybody, thanks again for joining. Um, if you're heading into fall here, it's bidding season on a lot of projects. Before you go out and buy that equipment, please make sure you have our rental rates. A lot of people are floored at kind of the economical agreements we can make from a duration, rental duration, rental terms, things like that. So we help companies of all sizes. 
Um, we want to partner with you. Again, we don't do lane closures. We're not competing with you for that traffic control service. We want to provide you the supplemental equipment, a lot of which we just covered today, so you can go out and bid and win more jobs. So we like to say any equipment, any duration, anywhere. So we'll help get it delivered directly to your job site. We got a great team behind you. Joe kind of heads up all our tech guys. Um, we stand ready to make sure you're successful. So again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, have a great afternoon and a, and a safe fall, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.